Hey guys, this week we're going to take a look at Optitex and it is going to be a, you know, fairly preliminary look at it. We're not going to delve too deeply within this program uh, because that is going to be saved uh, for FD25, which you'll exclusively use um, Optitex to uh, do all of your work in that course. But we're going to just sort of introduce the program, see what it's about, do one simple little project in it, and just get a little sort of introductory look at the program. So um, when you log into your VDI, you're going to look for Optitex and you're going to look for PDS. Um, and if you hover over it, this is one of the programs that comes in the Optitex suite. Um, it's probably the most essential one. And the PDS stands for Pattern Drafting Software because that is what it is. It is uh, software that we use uh, to create patterns. Um, so we're going to click on it and it'll take a little bit uh, of a minute to load up. So we're just going to wait for it. And this is what it looks like when you open it. Now, um, I have just the plain view, but um, what I want to do is get at least my toolbar. So if you don't have anything over here, uh, you, you may or may not. So your mine is loaded with sort of my preferences. Um, so what I want to do is I want to go to view and I want to get at least my toolbox in there because that is sort of our important stuff. So if you don't have that, um, go ahead and just click on view and click on your toolbar. So just like in um, Illustrator uh, where you can find things in view or they also have the Windows menu, um, in Optitex you can find anything that you need that might not be appearing on your screen uh, in your view option up here. Now if we look at it, this is the workspace, okay? This is our toolbox and this is our main menu up here. So it's formatted a lot like our Adobe products, again with our toolbar on the left hand side, the main menu up here. And what's here is really just shortcuts for the toolbox. So most everything that you can find in here, you can find up here, except for a couple other shortcuts they have as like print and save and open, which is of course shortcuts for your file menu. So let's just briefly gloss through um, the uh, main menu. Uh, the main menu, of course, with our file menu, we can see things that we typically see in our file menu, our save, our open, our new. Uh, we also have different things to export it. Uh, we have a digitizer option. So this is an option if you have a physical pattern and want to um, convert it into a digital pattern. Um, of course, we're not going to do that in this course, um, but uh, Optitex has that option. Um, we also have different options for printing. Uh, plotters are large format printers, so on and so forth. And then we have, you know, our other options like exit and open recent files. In edit, we can find all of our usual edit functions, undo, redo, cut, copy, paste. Um, like every other software that you'll probably be using, the keyboard commands are the same. So, you know, control X for cut, control C for copy, control V for, for paste, so on and so forth. Um, piece is our piece menu. Um, and this is where we can govern different things relating to our pattern pieces. So this is kind of like the object menu in, op in Illustrator. Um, where the objects would be pieces. Um, so the main difference between Optitex and say something like Illustrator is we have to create sort of fully formed pieces. We can't just create lines because if you imagine trying to sort of cut and utilize just a line in a pattern, it doesn't really work. So we have to work with at least a full 2D shape. Um, grading, we're not gonna be using this at all. Um, but just so you know what it is, when we talk about grading in terms of pattern making, um, it is when we take a, an original pattern and then adjust it into all the different sizes. So say we're starting with a size 6 um, and then we'll put it through a process of grading to get the size 8, the size 10, the size 4, the size 2, so on and so forth. And this is how you would manage all of those different sizes. Uh, our design uh, menu has a few um, uh, 
important um, functions, especially for measurement. So our segment length, you would go to uh, measure different segments, um, to add different things, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, the 3D box um, and also a few of the um, 3D menus and views that will pop up um, manage and help to function the 3D properties. So again, this is something else we're not going to get into, again, because we're doing just a very preliminary introduction. But Optitex has the capability of taking your 2D patterns um, and after you apply some parameters to those 2D patterns, um, it can run a 3D simulation on a 3D model. So uh, what you might see pop up on yours is a little 3D model over here. You can X out of that if you want. Um, I'll show you what it looks like um, when we get to the view because I'll, I'll just pop that up. But um, it's a very neat function so you can get a sort of 3D preview of what your uh, 2D patterns are going to look like. So tools here are just basically um, a, a similar reiteration of what's in your toolbox and what are in the shortcut bars up here. View, like I mentioned, um, lets you toggle the visibility of um, different menus and windows uh, in OptiTex. Uh, so you can have um, the piece window. This will keep track of all of the pattern pieces that you have so you can quickly switch from one to another. Um, you also have uh, the grading table, again, which helps you organize your different size sets. Uh, the toolbox, which we clicked on, which is this guy over here. Uh, style sets, which might be different sort of fabrications or whatever else. Um, comparing lengths can be uh, helpful to um, arrange, you know, uh, making sure like your back and front are the same lengths and things like that. Um, so on and so forth. And we also have, I'm just going to jump down to our 3D windows. And again, all of these different windows, we're not going to be using them, um, but uh, they help us create our 3D simulations. So a lot of times, um, Optitex will open up automatically with um, your 3D model over here. And there's different models that you can load. This is sort of the preset one. Um, and uh, we call her Ava, um, and we can put clothing on her um, uh, after we design the patterns for them. Um, but again, we're not going to be using this, so if this anything over here pops up, you can just X out of it. It gives you a little bit larger workspace. I like working with the largest workspace that I can sort of fit. Um, so anything extraneous or something that I don't need, I'll click off of it. And again, um, so these are all windows up here for different things. All this, this first section, this is um, sort of other things that you can see. So guidelines, ruler, uh, very similar to our um, Adobe product. So we can toggle the ruler on and off, so on and so forth. Um, this is a, a cloud thing. It's, I don't think we even have it, uh, the option of using it. So whatever and help. Um, you know, uh, not usually typically very much help, but you can Google Optitex help and there are some very good sort of online wiki forums on how to use it. Um, if you get stuck, of course, you can probably just email me as well. <laughs> okay, guys. So the first thing that you're going to want to do, um, again, I've already done it, um, but you're going to want to go to edit. Um, I'm sorry, you're not going to want to go to edit, you're going to want to go to tools. I was thinking, sorry, it was still in my head for Adobe because the preferences in Adobe are listed in edit, um, but the preferences for um, Optitex are listed in tools, so I'm sorry. The very first thing that you're going to want to do is go to tools and go to preferences. Um, and this is because Optitex will typically start in metric. Um, because that's what the world uses. However, uh, us being in America, we are going to be using inches for the, our project. Um, so uh, to ensure that you have the right measurements for your project, um, you're going to want to go ahead and switch to inches. And we're going to say OK. Um, now, if you weren't in inches, you'll see the ruler change slightly. Um, if you are already in inches, um, it won't change at all, like for me. Um, but 
let's you know just double check make sure it looks like this um, I'll show you the difference actually so um, if you're in centimeters which is the default thing for it to go to um, it'll be sort of in base 10 or base 5 really because you'll count by fives um, but if you're in inches it'll count by twos um, and this will also sort of depend on how zoomed in you are but if you haven't done any zooming uh, that's what it will look like Um, just to sort of go over this, so your tolerance is it's um, basically what it's going to round up to, and we have it to two decimal places, which is perfectly fine for our uh, purposes right now. Um, and this may or may not be clicked for you. Um, it just depends on how you prefer your numbers, if you prefer them in a decimal format or if you prefer them in a fraction format. I prefer mine in a decimal format because it's easier for me to add. Um, a little easier than you know trying to find that lowest common denominator every time you can just plug it into a calculator a little bit easier um, but as you'll see as we go along uh, Optitex actually has a pretty fluid interface and can handle both fractions and decimals uh, easily well so you can if you just want it to show you in decimal which I prefer again depends on you if you want fractions um, or don't feel comfortable with fractions, go with decimals, but if you feel more comfortable with fractions, um, uh, I don't know who you are, but <laughs> uh, you can, of course, work in fractions if you prefer. Okay, so what we're going to do is I'm going to just sort of go through our first project and take that opportunity um, for each step along our project to sort of tell you a little bit more about OptiTex. Um, so the first thing that we're, oh, let me tell you a little bit about our project. So if you've already read the assignment um, handout, we are going to be making a very simple uh, pattern uh, with only two pieces, and it's going to be a pattern for a very simple pillowcase. Um, and this pillow is going to be a 16 by 16 square pillow, um, and the front is just going to be a solid piece. Uh, and the back is going to consist of two overlapping pieces uh, so you can kind of uh, pull them apart, stuff in your pillow, um, and be on your merry way. <laughs> Close it back up again. So um, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to work on our um, uh, front pillow. So there's two ways to start a piece in OptiTex. We can either draft it with our draft tool, or we can go to piece and create new piece. Now we're not going to be doing any drafting for this piece, um, and this is because these are gonna be very, very simple pattern pieces. Um, so we can use just the create rectangular piece to create all of our pattern pieces. But just for the sake of a little bit of an introductory formality, I'm going to use the draft piece a little, uh, a little bit, uh, or the draft tool a little bit, just to show you how it works. Now, it works an awful lot like the pen tool in Illustrator with a few differences. So on its very basic level, it works exactly the same. So if I click, it makes a point, okay? You can't see it because it's there. Now it's going to kind of draft out this line, which is the same as an illustrator. And if I click again, it's going to make another anchor point. And it's gonna make a point and make a point and make a point and make a point until I get back to my original point. Um, and again, I can't finish the line or finish the drafting until I have that fully enclosed 2D shape. Again, and that's just the nature of pattern drafting. We work in fully 2D, not 1D. Um, so we need that full um, 2D shape, that closed shape. And once I get there, it's gonna ask me if I'm done, and I say yes. Now, <clears throat> I'm just gonna uh, delete away the piece by selecting it and then deleting it. And what might happen to you, I have it turned off on my version, um, but what you may see when you click is this. Now I got that by holding down the Alt key. And the Alt key will force a measurement box to pop up. And it's gonna ask me different things like, 
is this point exactly where I want it? Now, um, when we're using a PDS, measurements are really important um, because of course, whenever we're making patterns, measurements you know, are, are guiding light for everything. Um, and this is asking me pretty much on this ruler, is this exactly where I want to be? And we can see, so it just so happened I clicked at you know, negative four and a half, so you can see that's exactly there. If I bring it there on the, the X or uh, horizontal ruler, and is it exactly at 11.06 here? Is that exactly where I want it? Well, let's just say it is, so I hit OK. Now, subsequently from there, when I get the measurement box, I can have a couple other options. So this again is asking me exactly on the ruler, is that where I want it? But I can also choose measurements based on my last point by toggling this down to last point. So this would be my last point, so the point I made directly before this one. And it's telling me all sorts of information about this point in relation to this point. Um, it's telling me that it is you know, about 13 and a quarter inches to the right. It's telling me that it is two and a half inches below. Um, and in total, it's 13.5 inches away. So this length is 13.5 inches. So if there's something specific I need, so if I need this to be specifically three inches below, I can just go ahead and type that in. Or if I need this to be specifically 15 inches long, I can type that in. So this will help us um, to get exactly very precise measurements. I say, okay. And then of course, I can't stop because I need the full shape, okay. Now, you might be saying, well, how do I get curve points? Is it the same way? That's, that's really the difference um, in OptiText as opposed to Illustrator. If I want a curve point, I will hold down the Shift key and just holding down the shift key will give me curved points. Now, just like in Illustrator, I can adjust any point that I want. And I can do that in movement, move point. And every tool, just that we're here, has a keyboard short command, just like in Illustrator. So if you get tired of going to the toolbox, you can just learn the key commands. But I'm gonna click this once, this point once, and then click it again to drop it, to move it. Okay, that's all I'm really gonna do for now because again, we're not even gonna be using the draft tool um, for this project. Like I said, we're gonna be using this, which gives us some nice piece, pre, uh, piece presets to work from. So for, to get my front piece, I'm gonna to go to piece, new piece, create a rectangular piece, okay? So I'm gonna name this front pillow because that's the pattern piece it's gonna be. Now don't worry, you can change this after and I'll show you how to do that um, maybe with the back piece. And like I said, this pillow is gonna be 16 by 16. So I'm just gonna punch in 16 by 16. And there we are. Now, this is gonna give us pretty much our, uh, uh, our front piece. We don't have to do anything else in terms of shape to this piece. However, we do need to do a few other things. So for this piece, think about everything you need for a pattern piece. Now, if you haven't taken any sort of FD21s or garment constructions or anything else, this might seem a little foreign, but don't get too overwhelmed um, because uh, you'll get this, you know, uh, again and again, and it'll seem, you know, simple by then. I'm just gonna zoom out a little bit right here so I can see the full thing. So what are some of the things that a pattern piece needs? Well, one of those things is seam allowance. Now seam allowance is a little bit of extra fabric that we leave past the actual contour line or what we call the sew line. So this actual edge is what we would call that sew line or the contour line of the pattern piece. 
and it shows the actual dimensions of the finished patterns. But to be able to stitch this to anything else, we need that little bit of extra fabric coming out from here um, to be able to create those seams. And the amount of fabric that we use depends on what type of seaming uh, that we're going to be using. So stuff like hems will get a larger amount of seam allowance. Normal seams will typically get something like 3 eighths to a half an inch of seam allowance. And something that might be kind of very small and curved, like the seam allowance for an armhole facing or a collar or something like that, if it's very small and the shapes are, are very intricate um, and you get a, a, a lot of times a very tight curve, like especially with a collar or armhole, you might be get as little as a quarter of an inch seam allowance. Now for this, we're gonna go ahead and put a half inch seam allowance all the way around here, because we're just gonna use a normal seam to seam the back pieces onto the front. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to use the add seam allowance tool. And it looks like, it's right up here, it looks, or the add seam tool. Keyboard shortcut S, and it looks like a little sewing machine with a, uh, with a plus sign on it. And you can find it down here in your toolbox under seam. So we're gonna hit add seam, and we're gonna come out here and we get that little tiny sewing machine icon. Now, since I want an even amount of seam allowance all the way around my piece, I'm just gonna pick any point, click on it once, and then click on it again. And basically what that says to OptiTex is start at this point, go all the way around the piece, and end where you started. So this is a really quick and easy way to add seam allowance, uh, an even amount of seam allowance, all the way around your piece. So once I do that, I get my seam allowance dialog box popping up, okay? And what did I say? I wanted about a half an inch down here. So I'm gonna go 0.05, um, which is going to read as half an inch. Now I'm gonna do one other thing up here. Now these are all the options for how to corner it. And number one is don't do anything, just leave it. But we're gonna pick option two, and option two is going to miter the corners, which means it's going to sort of cut off that 90 degree angle right at the corner here. And we do this often with corners in patterns uh, because it's seam allowance that is not needed, and it gives us an excess amount of fabric, um, which if we don't cut off, uh, it won't make our corners nice and pointy. So anytime we have a corner that we want nice and pointy, we tend to miter off the excess seam allowance. So here we are, I have 0.5 down here, and I have option two selected. Don't need to worry about anything else, so I hit okay. And now you can see we have our seam allowance here, and let me zoom in on one of those corners so you can see that nice miter option in action. See how we just mitered it off? and that is reducing the excess seam allowance that we have, and it's gonna ensure that our corners to our pillows are nice and pointy. Okay, so now that we have our seam allowance, what else do we need on a pattern piece? Well, we have the pattern name right here, and we also have the grain line. Now, if you're just taking this course as a very beginner course, the grain line indicates what is called the length grain. So when we have a fabric, uh, we have two grains, the length grain and the cross grain. And this is a characteristic that is given the fabric when it's woven. So if you can imagine a fabric with lots of lengthwise lines coming down here like this, and then we get um, those are the yarns, and then we get the other yarns that are kind of like woven in between them like this. So these sets of yarns will create our length grain, and the other set of yarns that go horizontally will create our cross grain. Now this is important because, um, well, not so much for a pillow, but definitely for garments, because typically, there, there are 
are some exceptions, but typically we always want our length grain running vertically along a person. So if I have a skirt, I want the length grain running from the waist down to the ankles. Um, and this will create a different type of drape. So if we're not aware of our grain and we cut irregardless to our, uh, regardless of our grain, we're gonna get it hanging like off to the side or it's gonna be kind of weird and lumpy in some area. So um, we typically don't want that. Um, we can if we're trying to do some sort of experimental thing, but typically, you know, 99% of the clothing that you see, you know, if you see your pants, the legs of your pants have the grain running up and down your legs. Your shirts have the grain running up and down um, from your neck down to your, your hips. Um, and that's going to make the fabric fall properly. It's not gonna make it hang to the side or wrinkle weirdly or, you know, be kind of um, just off. Um, it also helps us put in pleats and darts and things like that. So um, a funny little anecdote, I had a student come to me um, just so aggravated and frustrated. She was trying to make a simple pleated skirt. She says, I don't know what is happening. I cannot get these pleats to say they go, they're completely unruly. Um, it shouldn't be this way. I should just be able to fold the fabric, iron it and call it a day. So I looked at what she was trying to do and she was trying to make the pleats on the cross grain and not the length grain, um, which is an incredibly easy mistake to make. But you notice it when you've been fighting with your fabric for hours and hours and it still won't pleat properly. And, you know, of course she smacked herself on the head and turned the fabric the other direction and had an easy go of it. Um, but again, just an example of why our length grade is important. And it's so important that it should be labeled on every single pattern piece to a pattern. Um, and it's, of course, OptiTex knows this, knows this. So as you've probably noticed so far, um, it will create a grain line which indicates the direction of the length grain on every single pattern piece that you make. So easy peasy, great. OptiTex already made it for us. We've already filled out front pillow, fantastic. Now it also has some of this other stuff down here, um, which is a, a little bit um, unnecessary. Um, the presets I have already have it in here, um, but I don't tend to like so much information. It's not necessary, um, but it doesn't really matter. You can keep it in if you want. Um, it's a fairly complex, um, uh, to get it off, I usually have to fiddle around with it a little bit, um, uh, with sort of settings and, and whatever else, but you can just keep it there. Um, this I would assume is probably the cutting information. We're going to do some, a little bit of extra information, um, but you can just ignore these guys right here. You also may or may not have these numbers down here. These are just lengths. So this is just reminding me that this is 16 inches. This is telling me that this tiny little miter is 0.71, whatever. Okay, so um, we're almost there. Uh, we need a couple other different sets of information and we're gonna add those in with the text tool. So we can add notes and pattern information with a text tool, again, that works very similarly to our Adobe products. Um, so I'm gonna come up here, and this is our text tool. We can also find it in the um, general tools. Or you can just hit T on your keyboard and get your text. So um, I'm gonna select the text, and I'm gonna make sure that I click within the pattern because that will tie it to the pattern. Um, doesn't really matter where you put it, just so long as it's on uh, the, you know, the pattern piece itself. Now in here, I'm going to add a couple different things. The first thing I'm gonna add is the style number. And we'll just do one, two, three for my now. Now the style number is a number or code that we give to every pattern piece within a sort of unit or garment. Um, you know, typically you're gonna be working with garments, um, not really relevant to this because this isn't per se a garment, but it is still a pattern. Um, and this helps us just organize our patterns. 
So imagine me, the pattern maker, with many, many, many different patterns to many, many, many different garments. I need some way to keep all my pattern pieces organized. Um, so if I give every garment a pattern number or a style number, I know that that's all relating to that one unit or that one garment. So me as the pattern maker who might have a million different sleeve patterns, I know which sleeve pattern goes to what shirt or what dress or whatever it is that it's gonna go to. Um, because again, those sleeve patterns might look awful similar. Um, and if I don't have them properly labeled and somehow all my patterns get messed up, um, I'm kind of in the dark to what goes to what. So we give every unit, every pattern piece within a garment or a unit, and in this case, or pillow or whatever it is, uh, the same number. We also give each um, pattern piece a size. So typically we'll be working with um, garments, which will have sizes like six, four, eight, or small, medium, large, or whatever else. Um, and it's just good to know what size we're working with. So um, to help us out, we give a size. Now this is a pillow, and let's just call it a medium-sized pillow for now. Now the last bit of cutting in, or uh, p pattern information I'm going to give is the cutting information. Um, and the cutting information should be on every piece. All of this information should be on every pattern piece. Um, and the cut information tells the seamstress or whoever is making this um, how to use this piece when cutting. So it tells them what to cut, how many pieces to cut, so on and so forth. Now this is gonna be very simple because for this pattern piece, I only need one. Um, so I need one of the self fabric. Now when we're working um, with garments and things like that, we'll use the word self to refer to the sort of main fabric. So the majority fabric. But if I have, you know, a piece like a collar, um, that might be not cut out of the self, it might be cut out of a contrasting piece. And collars need interfacing cut too to give them structure. So that cutting information is gonna be a lot more complex. That's gonna be something like cut to contrast, cut to interfacing. Um, so for everything that needs to be cut out of this pattern piece, that's what needs to be listed in the cutting information. So we're about done here, so I have my style number, my size, and my cutting instructions for the pattern piece. So I can hit OK. And there they are right there. They might seem a little small, but remember this is shrunk down to fit in your screen. So once we print it out, it's gonna be a lot bigger. Um, so no need to worry about the size. Okay, now there's a, a couple of the things that we need to add for the um, front pillow, and they're gonna be notches. So notches are utilized in patterns to help us align the pieces that are going to go together. So when we create patterns, um, they're individual pieces, of course, that are going to be sewn to one another. And the notches help us align all the pieces that are gonna come together. The, um, they also can tell us different things about, um, you know, different elements, like where a zipper is gonna end, or, you know, where a pocket's gonna be opened, or something else like that. Um, but since the notches we're going to have on our front pillow are going to be based on our where our back pieces align, I'm gonna go ahead and start on our back pieces first. Now I say back pieces because we're gonna cut two of them, but they're gonna be two of the same piece. So I only need to make one more pattern piece. And I'll indicate that we need two in the cutting information. So, um, like I said, our back pieces are going to kind of overlap and they're gonna overlap um, in the middle here. So we're not gonna have the full length of our front pillow for our back. We are for one edge, because it's gonna be sewn here and then sewn up here and then come across here on a finished edge. And then we're gonna have another one do the same thing over here on a finished edge here. And that'll give us the ability to sort of pull these two pieces open, stuff our pillow in, and then close it back up again. A lot of zip pillows use zippers, 
but I'm sure you've probably seen a pillow like this before. So I'm gonna come to piece, new piece, create rectangular piece, just like before. And um, I'm gonna purposefully not do the correct name. I'm gonna forget to label it back pillow because that's what it should be. And I'm gonna show you how to do that after we make the piece. Because of course it would be an awful clunky design if I couldn't go back and correct a mistake like that. And <laughs> So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna keep the length 16, but for the width, I'm gonna do it three quarters of the way up. And of course, three quarters of 16 is, you guessed it, 12 inches. And this gives our piece base here. Now, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to align my grain lines the way they quote unquote should be. This is fine here, it doesn't really matter. It'll matter more when we start to put the notches in, but me being kind of very specific and detail oriented, I like all of my grain lines to point upwards when I'm working on them. Um, it also gives me a great opportunity to show you another tool, which is the rotate piece tool. So if I want to rotate the piece around, um, and also just to note, you might notice that the select tool in Optitex is a lot less versatile than our arrow tools in Illustrator. So it can't do things like rotate or scale. Um, it is just used to select. That's it. It's used to select different elements. Like if I want to select a certain point, a piece, um, so on and so forth. So if you're not trying to select something, don't use the arrow tool. Um, what I am gonna use is the rotate piece tool, keyboard shortcut R, or if we go ahead into our toolbox, we can go to rotation, and it's the first tool we use there. So what I want to do is I want to rotate my front pillow so my green line is turning up. So just a quarter turn to either the right or the left. Um, probably the left, because I'm gonna get that little arrow pointing up. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click on a corner, and I, I don't need to hold it down. Typically we don't um, click and hold an OptiTex. It'll click to pick up and then click again to drop down. And we get this sort of green preview and I'm just gonna spin it over by moving the mouse and drop it. Now I don't need to be precise because as soon as I click again, it's going to give me a rotation dialog box where I can set in specific degrees of rotation. Pretty handy. So, <coughs> excuse me. So like I said, I wanted to rotate this a nice quarter turn which you may or may not know is 90 degrees. So I was almost there, um, but instead of using what I did, oops. Let me just go back. I think I, I accidentally clicked again. And I'm just gonna hit the 90 and that will go ahead and do it. Now I can, you can move your pieces with the, with the arrow tool. So now I have my nice grain line up here, fantastic. Now I want to finish off here. Now this piece is gonna overlap, like I said. It, we're gonna have one of the pieces kinda right here, stitched along the sides here, with a finished edge here. And then the other piece is going to do the same thing, but it's gonna be up here, giving that overlap here. So this is how I want it, because this is gonna be up like this but I want this line to go up like this. Now I can't fix that by rotation because it's not a square. Um, I have to fix it by manipulating the grain line itself. And we're gonna do that by using the baseline tool. So that's another thing to know about Optitex is I've said grain line, grain line, grain line, um, but Optitex for some reason has not adopted the same lingo that I have. Um, it calls our grain line the baseline, okay? Maybe a little funkier. 
So what I want to do, you might think new baseline, but actually not because we have a baseline. What we want to do is set the baseline direction. And it's this tool right here. Okay? Or if you want it up here, it's right up here. Okay? Or, of course, keyboard shortcut backslash. So it looks like this little diagonal line with a star, the little icon. Um, and what I'm going to do is, I, like I said, I want it to go straight up. And typically when we are setting our baseline or grain line, if you will, um, we are setting it very specifically to the pattern piece itself. So I like to use an existing line within the pattern piece to set my grain line or baseline. So what I'm going to do is instead of just going like this, which might give me some kind of weird angle or trying to sp spend a million years making this perfectly straight, I'm going to go ahead and click on this point and then click on this point because I know this line is perfectly straight and I know if the grain line is perfect, it's going to be completely parallel to this line. So um, it's just a helpful little method that I use um, to make sure that my grain line uh, is not askew or anything else like that. So now my grain line is perfect. Um, hooray. So I think the next thing that we can do is fix our piece name because again, it should not be piece. It should be back pillow. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna select on my arrow tool. And again, I just wanna show you how to do this if you had already wrote in back pillow, just take note, this is how you change it, because eventually you will make a mistake. It happens to all of us, I know. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to right click. Oh, sorry, no, I'm going to um, click and then right click on the actual name, on the piece right there. Right click with your mouse. And I'm going to go to attributes. Okay? Now this is gonna give me all sorts of um, different things that I can change about the piece name itself. Um, starting with the piece name. So I'm just gonna type in what I should have done before, back pillow, hit enter, and then we can see it change. We can also change the font size, the direction of the font, so on and so forth. I'm not gonna get into all the different stuff. Okay, so we are well on our way with our back piece. What do we need to do? Seam allowance. Now the seam allowance is going to be a little bit different on this, because as I said, so if I move it back to sort of visualize how it's going to come together, we can see that um, it's a half an inch all the way around here because it's going to be seamed to the front. And anywhere where we have, you know, two lines of a pattern coming together, the seam allowance needs to be the same. So I'd never have you know, um, you know, a piece where the seam allowance is one inch on one piece and the seam where it's going to be seamed to on another piece, it would be half an inch. So they always need to be the same. Um, might be some exemptions, but just say 95% of the time. So I know I need a half an inch all the way around these guys. But like I said, we're gonna finish this edge. We're gonna use a sort of hemming technique um, to finish the top. So I'm going to do an inch and a half on the top. So the way that we make an uneven uh, uh, seam allowance is we're going to apply the seam allowance a little bit different. And um, this is also going to give me a little bit of an opportunity to tell you a little bit about how OptiTex functions. And you see me kind of going in this direction with my mouse around this piece. And I am showing you it, what a clockwise direction looks like. Now this is important because OptiTex thinks only clockwise, okay? So what does that mean? Well, let me grab my add seam tool to show you. That means that if I click here, I have to start moving in this direction, okay? or at least that's how OptiText is going to think when we apply a pattern, or a seam allowance, or other such things. So say I want to apply a seam allowance just for this line. 
I have to go from here to here in that direction. Because if I go from here to here, it doesn't go this way. It, to get to this point, it has to go boop, and then all the way around the figure like this. So I'm gonna demonstrate that right now by applying our seam allowance. So let's add our half inch seam allowance first. So I'm gonna click here and here. Now remember that OptiText can't go in this direction. So instead of applying it to the top, it's gonna to go all the way around the figure um, and apply it everywhere but the top, even though it looks like I'm applying it to the top. And I already have my number two selected, so that's great. And I'm gonna add 0.5 here, okay? Now we can also keep these the same, and that is really how it's going to transition into our top seam allowance. So this is all fine. We can have two all the way down and half inch down here. Now, as you can see, it's applied my seam allowance precisely where I wanted it, around these edges where it's going to attach to the front, but left my front blank or my top blank. So to apply there, I'm going to go instead of from here to here, I'm going to go from here to here because OptiText can do that direction. And here we're going to go 1.5 and hit OK. And there I have now my hem allowance per se, um, uh, which is going to allow me to do a nice finished edge for the top here and then my half inch all the way around. Okie dokie. So uh, last thing I want to do for the back is give it its pattern information. So of course it's going to get the same style number because all the units in a uh, pattern are going to get the same style number. It's gonna get the same size, of course, those things will always be the same. And we're gonna have a slightly different cutting information. Um, now, a lot of times with these types of pillows, they'll have a sort of cheaper fabric back and a showier front. Um, so let's assume that's the case. And so I'm going to indicate the difference in the fabric to be cut by giving it a different name. Um, I could do contrast or in this, uh, I'm just gonna do backing fabric or backing for short. But I want two of those pieces. So that's how I indicate that two of these pieces need to be cut to complete the pattern. Okay, there we go. Okay, almost done guys. We only gotta put in our notches. So what I wanna do, and now I can visualize this better for you, is when we put on our back pieces, I wanna show where the edge of the back piece will be meeting on the front. And we're gonna have two sets of these, so four in total. So I wanna notch here, a notch here, and then when we do for our other piece, the overlapping piece, we're gonna have a set of two down here, okay? And that's just gonna help us when we are assembling the whole thing for sewing to know where the edge of that back piece should be lining up on the front piece. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use the Add Notch tool, which is right here, or if you prefer to look in your toolbox, um, it's in your points and notches and it's add notch, or of course, just keyboard shortcut N. Now what we're going to do is I'm gonna add a point right here, okay? And that's automatically going to pop up your notch dialog box. And it's gonna have a few things in here. Now, this is the second reason why learning that OptiText likes clockwise um, is important because that's how you tell your difference between your previous and your next point. So, how do I know my previous and my next point right now? Well, right now it's kind of easy to tell because I, I have one distance that is a lot longer than my next. So this is showing the absolute distance from our notch to the points that it is in between. Okay, and it's in between these two points. So one of these is my next and one of these is my previous. 
and spoiler, like I said, it's kind of easy to tell because one is a lot bigger than the other, so obviously the bigger distance leads to the previous one, which is our label. But what if it's not so easy? Well, let's start on our notch. And if we move around the figure in a clockwise manner, that is going to indicate how Altitext labels previous and next points. So here I am traveling around the figure in a clockwise manner, okay? If I start at my point, the next point I get to is this one, which is our next point. So again, traveling in this direction, that's my next point. Traveling around, traveling around, the one previous to hitting the point again is this one down here. So that's how we know it. So I also know that I want this notch to be 12 inches from this point. I was almost there, but not quite. So let's just fix it up and make sure that I get 12 in my notch. So there we are, and I get my notch. Now we have to do one on the other side, and you can see the sort of previous and next have switched. So if I travel from the point in this direction, this is my now my next point, and this is my previous point. So I can also change this to, uh, I'm sorry, four, 34, but four, to go ahead and throw in my notch. Now I need to do another set down here because we have our initial piece and I can always double check that by seeing how my piece lines up. Yep, looks perfect. Hooray. Now let's do it for the bottom pieces down here for the other overlapping piece. And um, I'm gonna go ahead and just talk about proportion down here. So if these are absolute values, which are hard measurements, like 12 inches, these are the proportionate values. So if I need something specifically in the middle, I can set it to 50% or 0.5. So that would be halfway um, in my uh, uh, measurement box here. Now, this is also um, showing me another interesting thing because now it's halfway between this point and this point because I have created a point when I made this notch, okay? So in this sense, I need to go by my absolute values because I know it needs to be four inches from here. So I'm gonna go ahead and put that there. Now that's not gonna give me 12 inches from here because I have this point interrupting my measurement. Now this kind of will go into a little bit of point properties and how um, Optitex takes measurements, but I don't really want to get into that today because I don't want to overload you and it's not necessary for this um, project. So we're just going to go by, we know that we need it to be four inches up from here and that's good enough for us right now. Let's do one for the other side. Of course, our next and previous are gonna be switched on the other side, and then there we go. And again, we can do the same thing. I can double check by matching up. My back piece here looks good. And everything's looking good. I got my pattern information, I got my seam allowance, I got my notches, I got my grains going the right way, I got my piece names. I'm done, this is a finished pattern, hooray. You too just completed your first pattern in Optitex. Um, not, not too hard, right? We start simple, not too bad. Um, so hopefully it wasn't too, too confusing. It's a fairly simple um, project. Um, but once you're at this point, let's go ahead and save it. Um, just like you're probably using the VDI for this. So just like um, in uh, uh, Illustrator or Photoshop, you're gonna have to save to your um, flash drive. Now you're gonna save this in file, save as, and you're gonna save as your name pillow, and you're gonna save it as a PDS file. Um, anything else I won't be able to read. 
Um, this is the Optitech specific file. Um, and I'm going to have to open it up in Optitech to grade it. So just keep it as a PDS. Um, make sure that you have your flash drive selected. I mean, this is probably old hat for you. And save it. Okay. You all uh, know it's saved because the name will change up here, like in all of the things. And then you're done. Congratulations. And not only are you done with your pattern, but you've completed the last project of this course. Um, so congratulations. Uh, I hope it was helpful. Um, and I can't wait to see you in actuality when we get back to campus, see your faces in other classes. Um, and it flew by, didn't it? Um, so again, thanks for taking my class. Uh, thanks for being great. And uh, hopefully it was helpful. If you want any sort of additional research, research um, um, not research, <laughs> resources, uh, just let me know. Um, and uh, look forward to, again, seeing you in subsequent semesters um, in subsequent classes. All right, guys, signing out. Bye-bye. Have a great rest of your summer. Log out. Be well.